When we first interviewed Eric three years ago, we had no idea how popular the Almanac of Naval Ravikant would be. It hit number one on Product Hunt as the most popular product that day, and it has since gone on to sell tons of copies. It's got 15,000 plus reviews on Amazon, and if you've spent any time on Twitter, you've seen people talking about this book nonstop for the past three years since it was published. In this conversation, we dive into the new book, The Anthology of Bology, which takes the same format and style of the last book, profiling and categorizing and summarizing the very best ideas from, instead of Naval Ravikant, from Bology. If you don't know much about Bology, I would definitely encourage you to take a look. He was formerly the CTO of Coinbase, and in addition, he was also a former general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. He's a prolific thinker known for his fascinating opinions about the future of technology, the future of media, and the future of human health. I took tons of notes reading this book and was so excited to sit down with Eric for this conversation. We discuss all sorts of interesting things, the future of different technologies, Bology's opinions about how to better find the truth in any situation and be less susceptible to being fooled, and so much more. I'm so stoked for you to not only listen to this conversation, but get a copy of the book, The Anthology of Bology. It's totally free, which is crazy that Eric does this. And I just think that Eric's doing massively important work for the entire world by publishing a book as good as this one. So without anything more from me, enjoy our conversation with Eric Jorgensen, round two. Eric Jorgensen, welcome back for a long-awaited part two interview. Thanks, guys. Feels like home. There's... A lot to talk about from this book, and Kyle is kind of making a comparison between the book and what the book comments about. Kyle, what's the other book? The Sovereign Individual. How the density of every page of the book is almost like its own book and long hour long conversation. Not just like every chapter is its own conversation, but really every page in some sentences could be like their own thing. Our goal is not to be like, let's see if we can compress this book into an hour, but which is actually the exact question I was going to ask, actually, but. The last book kind of has a built-in compression, right? It says everything is, it, it's productize yourself. And then that kind of really informed you to build your personal brand around one word, right? Like the le you became like leverage. Eric Jorgensen became leverage for, for a long time. Those like two things became very synonymous. It's like that was what your brand was about, learning how to apply leverage in your life and all of those things. Is there like a similar kind of filtering kernel that you would think about for this book? The, the like one sentence summary? If it's one sentence, if it's two words, it's whatever. It, exactly. I can probably do three off the top of my head, which is build using technology. I like that. Build using technology. I want to talk a lot in this conversation, not, again, not about the book itself, because I think it's a thousand percent worth reading. And this is something I've said on a lot of podcasts. It's like, I love our podcast. I think it's super valuable. But if you turned off our podcast and spent an hour reading a book like the Navalmanac or rent, turned off the podcast and instead spent the hour reading this book, I would be pleased. I'm like, that's <laughs> a solid substitute for your time and probably like a better use because this is just an incredible resource. And I want to talk about things that aren't like about the book itself, because I think if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't read the book or you aren't going to read the book, that's like, I cannot make a high recommendation to just go read the book. I have a million praises for it. I want to like kind of discuss what implications you think this book will have, because I think there's a very clear path for so many different entrepreneurs who can say like, this was a point reading the last book where I started taking this very seriously. I started doing this because I read it. And I think one of the biggest patterns was creating content and using and everyone kind of doubling down on media. So a lot of people started posting more consistently, more high quality content to attract opportunities and to kind of leverage the internet in all these ways. I think this book, like you said, build using technology, that's the big impact. What I'm curious to discuss is I think it's really easy where you can read the book, cl close it down, put up a YouTube video, write a blog post, put up more tweets and do that every single day and start seeing progress, have a dashboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like building using technology, that's just a much more, you don't just turn off the laptop and suddenly have hard skills and you crack out, you just encounter more friction and more difficulty. And it's not as nice of an easy path to just build and start innovating and doing stuff like that. Like, how do you think about the impact one that you want the book to have in terms mm. of tech optimism, but like actual tech activism Yeah. and the difficulty of just like, do you just like sign up for a physics master's degree? Is that like the right thing to do? I don't really know. I, I appreciate a lot about that question and the ideas and the suggestions in it. And I hope I remember to address all of them because I think there's a lot of good nuggets in there. Yeah, if, you're, if your major is undecided and you can switch from a non-technical major to a technical major, highly recommended. I, I've given a few like college talks and I always like try to try to give people that push of just like, you will pick up business along the way. You can pick up psychology for the most part with like a few good books. It's pretty difficult to like, teach yourself physics. So like use that educational context to 
install a program that's really hard to install by yourself. So pick technical topics, chemistry, biology, computer science, math, physics, something that will give you the foundation that will help you understand a ton of different technologies or how sort of the foundation of reality works that then you can like uh, more technologies are become accessible to you when you have that background. And I say that as somebody like without that, who is struggling to like install that software later on their own. So the other, the other word that you use in there that I think is, is a good one is like activism. So y not everybody is going to put down this book and go start like a hard tech company, nor should you probably, right? It's hard. It's a long, it's painful. It's capital intensive. <laughs> like what I hope the minimum that I hope that people take away from this is the technology is really fucking important and the foundation of every good thing in your life. Like the reason that we are not like cold, starving, stabbing each other and like being eaten by wild animals is centuries upon centuries of compounding knowledge and technology. Like humans cooperating and like building our core of knowledge is absolutely critical. And I think there's something about this time in which we are living where a lot of it is taken for granted. The generation before us saw absolute like physical miracles, like pre things that were previously considered like literally physically impossible, like flight, getting to the moon are the two most obvious examples. Uh, electricity before that, absolutely. Like if you lived before electricity, think about how mind blowing that would be to see your first light bulb. Like that is an insane unlock in like the tech tree of humanity and our lives for at least, you know, I'm not 40. We haven't seen crazy physical breakthroughs basically outside of computers and software, which is just a way more abstract form of innovation than something like seeing a plane fly for the first time or seeing somebody go to the moon. And we are, we have in the future hopefully the near future, like another industrial revolution. I did a podcast with the author of where's my flying car. And like, that is the thesis of that whole book, which is like between AI energy in particular, nuclear energy and nanotechnology, like there is another hundred X in capabilities in the physical world that is coming. If we get off our ass, respect technology, invest in it, vote for people who appreciate it, support new companies involve technology in our own jobs and our own businesses and just like in general appreciate it. So you don't have to start a company, but like at the very least, please sort of become a cheerleader for new technologies and appreciate the role that they play in our lives and look for ways to support them and appreciate them and understand how much good can come of it and that our lives are good because of it. And we owe that to future generations to not squander the opportunity to to build on what we have and make their lives better too. I think a lot about what you discussed in the book about like a parallel media ecosystem. Mm. I think that an example of this done really well and on a different kind of value skew, parallel in a different way. Like I think the Daily Wire and Jordan Peterson have kind of fully embraced this. They're like, we're not going to change traditional media to be the way we like it to be, to talk about the things we wanted to talk about and the ways we want to talk about it. So they're not just saying, okay, like a a right-leaning news website, but they're now putting out children's content, a parallel Netflix, a parallel, like every aspect of the internet, hyper-produced content, documentaries, television, edu like the t like an entire parallel ecosystem yep. because they have a set of principles and beliefs and things they want to advance in the world that are just, you're not getting anywhere else in at least that type of way. And I think that's a lot of what this has to become as well, but not on like the political, I mean, somewhat on the political spectrum, if you think of technology as political and especially a lot of the regulations about risk into technology and like being letting things come into existence, not criminalizing math and, and other things like that. Yeah, that's part of the challenge of the innovation in what I'm talking about. The physical stuff is like it's very difficult uh, to legislate away software and computer innovations. It is not, you know, it's very easy for the government and, and governments around the world to have legislative control over what you do with atoms in the physical world. So like, that's largely the story of nuclear, right? Like we had amazing, like the nuclear plants that we are building now are somewhat improved, but some people are still building off basically the plans that we had in the seventies that we just stopped using. And like, we could have massively cheaper energy if we had a shitload more nuclear plants. And there's a reason not to build them other than fear mongering and political oversight and misaligned incentives and 
organizations like Greenpeace who are purport to be environmentalists, but misunderstand that to the point where they think that like technology should regress because impact to the environment should minimize when actually the right thing to do is invest in the technology like nuclear that has a minimal impact on the environment. Like otherwise you are <laughs> to be anti anti energy is to be like pro poverty and you're just like holding humanity down, giving us less scarce resources, make desperate people and desperate people do not treat each other kindly. And so I think like if we want to continue to have safe, happy existences on our daily lives, like we need to have sort of this expansionary view of the world and immediately and to the maximum degree possible use new technologies and the best tools we have to solve problems and create abundance for people because scarcity is, is a dark, dark path. And I, I, I can't really empathize. I, I find it really difficult to understand the worldview of somebody who's who really like is trying to hold us back, who just doesn't see like how that, how that arc ends. Yeah. This, the, these ideas in this book are so like mind blowing. It's hard to formulate a question around specific things in the book. One of the, the main points is like seek truth. Mm -hmm. And another thing that, you, that is talked about is like the, the way that people lie with statistics specifically around like. Uh, measurements for the improvement of human life and how Balaji's like favorite one to use is like mortality and life life expansion because things like GDP and all of these other metrics are compromised yeah. and there's so much of like the world that is um, compromised by special interests and the interests of other people and like distilling down to base truth is is super important and i feel like that's what you know that's one of the main recommendations of this book is like get to the truth mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if there's really a question there more than just like i want to hear your take on it after reading and consuming so much of this content and obviously putting this together yeah i, I really like the idea that you pointed out mm -hmm. that technologists and entrepreneurs should aspire to change objective metrics in the physical world. And the example that he uses is life expectancy it used to be the key measure of sort of technological progress, right? We used to have a really high infant mortality rate. We used to have a much uh, lower life expectancy in worldwide, which is partly medicine, but also partly health and also partly war and also many other things like heat and air conditioning probably save a lot of lives or help people live much longer and more comfortable lives. So there's a lot of things like that where the scoreboard for technology was giving humanity new capabilities. Um, that has, depending who you are, where you're looking, technology has become a, a very, bit of a muddled word and people like talk about the the tech industry now as though it's an industry and it's not really like technology is not an industry technology exists in every industry to some degree and it's just who's using what technology like software is only one technology and there are many many other ones the sense of progress in tech is not did we build a big company like did we create value for shareholders it's did we give humanity new capabilities like can we do something we could not do before and it's really changed, you know, I've, uh, I have a small venture fund that I run and it's changed how I think about and assess companies. Like when we look at, when we look at a technology or a founder and their vision, like, are they giving a net new capability to humanity? And so one company we invested in recently is Adam Limbs is building these mind controlled robotic prosthetics, prosthetic arms. They are 10 X cheaper and 50 X better than the previous like state of the art. That's a new capability for humanity. Like we weren't even close to anything like that before. And it unlocks some really interesting things around like that truly could improve life expectancy. It could really improve the life of many, many people who've been through accidents or who were born without a limb. That's an incredible thing. And that's the, like, that's the bar I think for technology. It's, it's not, that's not to say everyone shouldn't be using it, but like that's what I value in it, right? 
Yeah, I mean, people today equate technology and tech companies with whatever the the new thing of the day is. But like one thing Lewis talked about recently with me is, uh, and help me out, Lewis, like the moving parade, David Ogilvy. Um, Advertised to a moving parade, a standing army. Right. And when I was reading this, like I was reminded that like we or technology is like a moving parade and we're like watching it happen. Like David Rockefeller was a tech entrepreneur and that was just 150 years ago. And today we have new technology that is unlocking new things in the world. And it's a parade of technology in front of us. Maybe we're the, I don't know which one's moving, but, uh, <laughs> we're both moving. Okay. <laughs> I'd say. Yeah. We, we need, we need to remember that everything that we take for granted today was the technology of the past and that those opportunities exist all around us today. And I think, you know, I, I prefer to kind of work at the frontier where you can grow the pie, where you can advance society. And I feel like the people who are going into law or finance or, or even just like doing a good job of the same way things have always been done are kind of not missing the point, just like not living up to their potential of getting closer to new technologies. I, I don't care where you work. I don't care what your job is. I don't care what industry you're in. There is a way to apply technology to whatever problems you have in front of you and solve them in a new, better way. And if everybody sort of does that to some extent, like you make all of humanity better when you do that. Otherwise you're just, you, you know, you're a rat on a treadmill. And like, you're keeping, you're keeping us moving, but you're keeping us alive, but you're not keeping us moving. And I, I think I just value see finishing this book and spending so much time with these ideas. I just value it so much more, so much differently. And I'm not, I'm not like a huge, like try every new tools guy. Um, like it actually takes work for me to like, like I, I'm a little lazy in that way. Like I'm a hardworking person, but like that is, it's high effort to go find a new tool and understand it and triage it. and like Lewis, I know you did this with, with, uh, AI in particular, like you were, you have a lot of new, interesting use cases. And I know it's effort to like put those together, but you see the results of what comes out of something like that. And your capabilities and your output are just so much higher now than somebody who hasn't done that work. And I'm sure that paid off, I don't know, in weeks, months, like uh, what's your assessment of how much more productive you are with that tool in your life than you were before? I think definitely difficult to, to quantify. I think there are certain pieces, if we think of like, when I was quoting and scoping out custom AI projects that basically forced you to build a mental understanding of what knowledge work is in terms of like reusable components, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like what are the processes that constitute knowledge work? And so for something like writing a weekly newsletter that's aggregating a lot of information, like all of the discrete steps, if you're to break down this process into 30 things, it's like aggregate a lot of information and then analyze the information and analyze is actually broken down into like cluster the topics, define what the topics are, and then rank the topics by importance, and then summarize the articles and do all like you have to literally break down every step and what the thinking and reasoning that goes into that step is. And then basically you realize if you understand it well enough to describe it in those terms, then you understand, then you can automate the entire thing, right? So anything that you've actually taken the time to understand in the level of steps and right, you're you've interacted with Jack Butcher on both of these projects. And he has a saying that's like, if you don't understand what you're doing well enough to describe it as a process, you don't know what you're doing. But there's this equilibrium there where if you do actually understand it well enough to describe it as a process, then you no longer need to do it because the, the shift people haven't really understood about AI, specifically GPT-4, is that it is fully literate, right? It is literate. It can read information. Like you give it instructions and it understands them. And then it can act on those instructions. So anything that you truly understand well enough to like train another employee on doing, there's very, very few things that you wouldn't actually get. And this is in the, in the realm of knowledge work that you just wouldn't give to AI instead of another person. So anything that I've done that's like repeatable is just, there's, I just don't do it because it's, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. so that's just like, I'm working just as much, but I'm working on higher impact things, if that makes yeah. sense, right? Because I'm also not in the, this is what Bology talks about in the book, right? It's like he uses the capital he accumulates to work more it's like get rid of things that prevent him from working more. And that's what I do as well. But obviously with a stopping point to like enjoy life and, and be balanced. But I, I just pro you forget them immediately. It's, it's 
what we're talking about cyclically with technology, mm -hmm. it's the same way. Like everything that's already part of my process, <laughs> yeah. it's just like, oh, you don't have right 49 inch monitor where you have a third of it with GPT-4 open the entire day and then another tab with all of your pre-safe prompts. And as you just go, that's just the workflow, right? That's just like as nat natural as if I was doing engineering work, I'd have a, you know, TI-84 on my desk all day. It's the same yeah. pool. And it's easy to forget that you're probably doing, I don't know, the, t the work of a team of two or three, three and a half, like different people, if we were talking about the tools of three years ago. I'd say that's likely. I'd say that's super likely. It's... But there are certain things you just don't do anymore. Just like first drafts. Like you don't do a first, first draft. And there's no such thing as doing a first draft anymore. Interesting. You just like describe a draft and then edit the yeah. draft. But even the edits can be described with like parameters. And then when you save your preferences, then it's game over. Yeah. And then when you've written a prompt that you say, okay, now this is how you extract my preferences from this dialogue. It's, it's very quick. Now, it, and it's going to take decades, tr tragically, for this to actually like reach utilization of tons of people. And so the sort of the, the lightest possible intervention that I hope maybe this book has is kind of like ChatGPT might be like the single most impactful tool since computers for knowledge workers. So if you're doing knowledge mm -hmm. work and you're not using ChatGPT, like go get it immediately and figure it out and get on YouTube and DM Lewis and get some tutorials like like yeah. the, respect the technology, learn to use it. And the, the, the ripple effects of that outwards were like, Helping your parents, helping your coworkers, helping other people who need it. Oh like, yeah, help my grandma write a speech. Tweet, tweeting about like what you learned and sharing your prompt library. Like these are tiny ways. Like you don't have to quit your job and go start a hard tech company. You don't have to you know go get a master's in physics, but respect the incredible power of the tools that we've created. And you know, ChatGPT is like one software example for knowledge work that should be easy to grok but the same thing exists in let's finally admit that like nuclear power is an insanely good thing and we were crazy for suppressing it for stupid political reasons or that we should have the right to take experimental drugs with our bodies like if you can go bungee jumping and risk death that way and you have a terminal illness it's fucking insane that the fda has the right to withhold potentially life-saving drugs that could help other people and not let you take that. Like that's an insane piece of legislation that should change. So there's a lot of there's a lot of those things, but just seeing the world through this sort of through this lens of how much good comes out of technology and how many ways that we are just stepping on our own foot, punching ourselves in the face when it comes to like preventing this technology from improving lives. And it's, you know, there's a bunch of people who's immediate near-term livelihoods are threatened by it and you can understand from an incentives perspective why there is resistance to it but there's always like an info war about all this stuff right like this big actor strike is about ai like the hollywood came to a complete halt because people are afraid of like what ai can do and wanted to like negotiate about you know what tools they could use and what writers were doing like is that actually what's good for humanity? No, it's what's good for like those people for the next five years of their career. And they're afraid of getting a pay decrease because this new technology came out. But like, let's look, you know, pretend you are God playing the video game of humanity. Like what is good for the mass, the most people of humanity, not just today, but in the future. And what you'll find is the loudest voices are almost always the people who are like near term threatened not the vast majority who are silent or don't care, but would actually benefit if from the improvements that this loud minority is holding back. I want this to come across as a compliment <laughs> for sure. <laughs> what an amazing, what an uh, amazing tee up. I bet the ladies love that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Stop from getting into this. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> I think that this book like the other book to really oversimplify it, the Naval book is very much like as an individual, this will help you get rich. I mean, that is literally the, the sweet storm that inspired the book. It's like how to get rich without getting lucky. This book is just far more collectively important in terms of like, if that makes sense. Like the other book is it, it, like when you read this book, you're like, fuck, like getting rich is cool and stuff. And they'll probably be good to like have money to do stuff and leverage. But and like, obviously, when you have Money is a tool, a form of leverage to evangelize about topics and fun startups and it's amazing and all these amazing things. But I'm like, 
that book, I'm like, if that was required reading in high school, we'd have a lot of more successful entrepreneurs, which would be like massively downstream. But if this one was required re reading for high schoolers, I'd be like, okay, we'd actually have like a literate society, <laughs> not just like literate, like in terms yeah. of knowing how to read, but just like knowing how not to be fooled by everything constantly all the time. And I don't know, I feel like the past couple months and years, it's been like, I don't really know how to say that, like, I haven't really come to a, a, a way of like framing this. I feel like we've kind of all been fucking around a little bit just because it's kind of just been one of those like easy times. It's like kind of the, the cycle. It's like things have been good. So we've been fucking around talking about fun stuff. And this book kind of is just like, just like do something more serious. Like just like work on something more important. Yes. Solve a more important problem. Take on more responsibility. Don't stay out of the conversation. Like, I don't know. I just, the book is important. Yes. I feel like, I feel like it's important that it exists. I don't know how to get people to read it. This is one of those books that's like, please just like, you don't realize how stupid you are until you read this book and be like, oh, I've been, it, I, I'm just like <laughs> ranting, but it's so good. And just so many things. I'm like, and myself as well, a lot of imperfections, but I'm like, if only someone realized, like, I think reading Taleb helped mm -hmm. me with a lot of the truth stuff and like starting to be less, what's it called? Yes. Gullible, just like yes. less gullible. But this book is just another barrage of just like, you're being fooled this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. And this is why this isn't better. And this is why this isn't better. And it's like, please, everyone understand. And, and this if chapter. you want to succeed, like learn to see through the bullshit, learn, learn to like understand fundamental truths and act on them. Yeah. I, I mean, I did this because I think it's, because I think it's so important. I think it's so, so important. No, it's, um, yeah, it's... And I, I also hope everyone reads <laughs> it. And obviously like, and again, just like the Naval version, if, if, if a book is steep for you, or if you just want to take a chance, like, uh, don't want to take a chance on buying it or whatever, for whatever reason, like this version is also available for free on biologyanthology.com. So like you can pick up the PDF, you can access this yourself. You don't have to buy the book to get the knowledge. It is important as hell. And, and please just like take a look at it on the interaction between the two books, which you kind of mentioned at the beginning of that beautiful rant that I loved so much. It, you called it a rant. I, I just consider it a, a beautiful keyed up compliment, high key compliment. As I think <laughs> an angry compliment. <laughs> a lot, a lot of people, a lot of the chatter around the Naval book. I, th I think the Naval book is very, it, it's very high level. It's very philosophical. It's, it is, it kind of fixes your brain on some of the things that you may have been told or not told about what's important or what's high leverage or where to place your attention, but it's not super tactical it's it's not like here's what to go do um it, it kind of highlights the importance of things and this i i, I think that this book is much it, it is a very natural next step from the almanac of naval and i think it answers a lot of questions or at least creates specificity in areas that the naval book left general i guess that's the best way to say it I think you can put down the Naval book and feel like you understand more, but don't necessarily know where to start. I think you can put this book down and get to fucking work. And, and like, that's what I want. That's what I want people to do. I, I hope that it changes how you think about your work, how you think about the impact of your work, how you think about what good is and, and like, not just good for you, but good for the greater good. I, I, I think that it has the capability to, to change that in people's lives. And I tried to create the most, a version of that message that is very accessible, very broadly applicable, very evergreen. Like, I hope that this is still useful for, for the, the moving, you know, the marching army or the moving parade or whatever we said in, uh, yeah, moving parade in, in 10 years or in 15 years. And it still serves as a good reminder or a good example of what's important, the value of technology, how to actually like get off the ground, how to choose ideas very specifically, how to validate them, how to build your first version, how to find a technical co-founder if you aren't one, what to study, how to find the edges of new technologies that are just becoming possible, like where to go look for papers and like find things that are just freshly newly possible, which is where you find these these technologies that in, in Balaji's words invalidate the assumptions of incumbent sort of companies and politicians, mm -hmm. which I think is a really powerful way to look at what companies to start, you know, what what business models or what solutions just became possible that other people either don't believe yet or don't know how to access or don't have to take the risk on because of that innovator's dilemma tension. I think this is a really good handbook 
for people who want to build something big and important and do it successfully. I think, and then I'll let Kai ask a question here, like one more teed up angry <laughs> compliment rant, and then uh, there won't be a question from it. I think, so, you know, you're now the acting CEO of Scribe Media, which published the book Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. That book, a lot of people like made them want to run through a brick Fuck wall yeah. with their bodies. Yeah. You know what I mean? This book, maybe you can say like, it makes people want to run, like run their minds like through a that. brick wall almost. It'd yeah. be like the comparison. Kyle's but I, muted, I but he's laughing his ass off. It's like, <laughs> he's laughing his ass off over there. I think the big other takeaway for me about this book is the importance just wear your beliefs mm. more loudly. And this is kind of what I was getting at with like fucking around. I think there's kind of like a Dunning Kruger effect in like politics and loud belief. Like a lot of smart people, and this is a question Kyle asked you three years ago, was like, I don't want to be wrong in public. How do I handle that? That was one of his questions from our podcast back then. And I think that a lot of smart people realize that like they're probably wrong about a lot. So they just don't express their opinions that loudly. And so then you kind of have this like really perverse like problem where it's, it's a lot of stupid people shouting about things. Then you're afraid to express your opinion because it's unpopular because and you don't have enough like enough rigor to back it to like make it anyway and to like tell everyone that they're wrong and that's kind of been like this whole messy soup of kind of how we yeah. are now it's just like really common sense things getting you in trouble like how it's so so pathological that like having a very common sense opinion gets you in trouble and i don't i don't know i just think this book is like fine like it's like an actually well-formed piece of ammo in the opposite direction of some really really damaging trends that like we should all be fighting yeah. pretty aggressively and like put AR-15s <laughs> in our backdrops or whatever other like version of your politics you can like make more loud. But that guy is just like, he's psychologically yeah. reminding you, he's like, I can do that. Like he's he's wearing his beliefs and that's keeping his, that's forcing things forward by advertising them. It like doesn't yeah. not have an impact. It's like wear the hat or to put the gun in yeah, your backdrop. I, that's a, it's a good, I hope that people feel empowered to make up their own mind by some of this. I, I think it does a, 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 a biology in it and the ideas in it do a good job of helping you giving you permission to sort of dismiss the popular narrative and understand the incentives at play about the misinformation that you might be receiving and really get to a fundamental truth and learn how to test them yourself and really like build something that is for the, for the greater good that also can be successful, right? Like he's got, he's got plenty of, there's probably, I haven't counted specifically, but I bet there are 15 or 20 quite concrete business ideas in this of which probably 10, five to 10 are specifically like new media business models or new twists on existing media models that are not harmful, largely constructive, potential for much higher profitability. Like it shows you kind of some of the corners around, around which we're going to, we're going to turn in the media world. And I, I don't know. I'm I'm very optimistic that people will do exactly what you're saying and, and be feel empowered to speak out their version, have a common sense or a contrarian opinion that is not contrarian for the sake of getting fucking views and getting people angry and replying, but contrarian in the sense of like, I think that this is a more fundamental, like honest truth. And I'm not going to be afraid to, I'm not going to be afraid to say it. Yeah. I think there's also a confidence in your own ability to determine the truth because mm -hmm. it's like, for me, you know, it, it's like, I don't have enough information. I don't, there's not, I, I could still be wrong. There's a, there's a gap between like a, 98 and a hundred percent. And in that gap lies like all of my personal in, uh, lack. Right. And like, so get all the resistance to dude if you're at 98 percent, you're more right. sure than in, almost anybody well, is about anything <laughs> like that. i don't especially all the people that are actually loud and wrong like right not, like that's not the bar you know like uh, nobody nobody should mm -hmm. anybody who says they're 100 percent certain of anything is probably full of it right like you talk to anybody who with an actual r rigorous that is an important like, that's very important background and they will always say even the fact that, you know, the sun rises tomorrow morning is only a 99.9999999 like cent chance. Like there yep. is, everything is a hypothesis mm -hmm. in the um, process of being proven, upheld or disproven. And that's a really important thing to remember. It's like we are all, it's all sh I think shades of gray. It's all in the process of being learned. And when you are, mm -hmm. when you are open about what you think you know, 
it makes it much easier for other people to like bring stuff up and agree or disagree or like you know there's the old joke of like there's no faster way to learn something than to post the wrong answer on twitter and if you if you're willing to do that it increases your rate of learning sometimes you know it's wrong maybe or you have a hunch but you don't know the right answer sometimes you don't and you know sometimes it can be a painful like learning process but you you do learn and people who engage in good faith are usually happy to teach you there is there are some is a, perhaps a more useful like answer to the question is like there's some chapters and um i think quite useful tactics in there from bology about like he's really good at this like he's really good at presenting a strong case having evidence based things having a real conversation about like an intellectually honest thorough conversation to the root of the problem about something that he believes and it's often a contrarian belief and he's also he's often attacked for it but the way that he engages with people and you can you can see this on twitter he'll post he'll post something with like six assertions or points or supporting things and he'll have citations and he'll have papers and he'll have and he he talks in the like i, I put excerpts in the book of where he talks about how he thinks about that and who is worth engaging with and how he engages and what kind of evidence you look for. And you can recognize when you're talking with someone who also wants to learn the truth and is seeking a source mm -hmm. of that truth and you are working towards it together instead of someone who is just attacking you to attack you and isn't interacting with the data or the fundamental assertion or any of that. And it's a really important skill, like to your point, Lewis, on like what the what the dialogue is and who's talking about what like we have to be able to disagree without feeling or 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 collaboratively learn like that's that is some of the magic of the technology that we have is we have a global town square that's a real-time conversation about every topic in the world if we can't go into that conversation in good faith then you know, put forward something that we think or that might be true or that, and then work towards it together. Like it's going to do more harm than good, which I don't think is true over the long run, but like it's, it's a skill that we all need to build. One thing along those lines that I'm curious to ask you about is like in the book, it talks about blockchains and how history is no longer written by the victor. Like history is being constantly like written in stone, basically. And one of the things that I've talked about on the podcast many times is like, when you're writing a, a research paper today, you can Google and find evidence for both a claim and its counterclaim. And you can, you can basically write a research paper and then start Googling the sen sentences and back up the, back it up. It's not to say it's based truth, but it, there's like uh, uh, evidence, right? And so in the future like historians will be combing through information that is written in stone on a blockchain trying to determine like reality and it's like we're entering this like mist of information where history is written by everyone all the time and so like i i think that there actually is going to be maybe not by the victor but someone's going to write history as a line through this mist mm -hmm. Because otherwise, there's just too much information for anyone to come to any conclusion because you can find evidence for the claim and its counterclaim. Yeah, it's a, it's a very tricky problem. Like determining what is true is very, very hard. And it may not ever get easier, but like we have some technology that is helping. We have some stuff that's working the other direction, right? Like the proliferation of information and the the, I think it's really interesting that we basically invented like we we got through AI, we got the capabilities to like fabricate really convincing fakes at roughly the same time that we created the blockchain, which is like a way to combat the, the generation of those fakes. And you you'd be able to verify like the, the UI isn't there for this yet, but I don't think it, it's a it's a matter of some months or small years of programming interface improvements to to get a platform where any video that wasn't originated by the user account that created it is like marked as sus um, and, and vice versa, right? So I think there's, there are, for every new technology, there are threats and opportunities and we see those all over the place. In my mind, 
going back through history, like it's very, very, very hard. And I don't know that I've had a convincing answer yet to find a technology that has done more harm than good. Like almost every technology invented has on balance done more good than harm. That's just to say harm isn't, isn't done. And you see a lot of people who are anti the particular technology touting like how, how, oh, the, this technology is causing problems. And we're seeing that happen in real time to your point uh, about like two different versions of history happened in self-driving cars. So 10 years ago, when autonomous cars were theory, everyone's like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is going to save like millions of lives. This can't come soon enough. Now we have it. Like you can take a driverless taxi around Austin, San Francisco, Phoenix, 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 and, and more are coming soon. Like it's an incredible, it's a fucking miracle that people aren't talking about. And number two, that every article you see from traditional media coming out of San Francisco is about how like a self-driving car caused, you know, a caused an ambulance, a delay and this and that. And then you actually like go read the article and the ambulance crashed into the self-driving car. Like there, there's like, for some reason, I, I'm serious, the headline every time is like self-driving car causes delay. And then the, the body of the text, there's three or four examples of this oh, are, are like the, the full details of the incident. And it's like, please tell me, like raise your hand and sign the petition. Like who are these politicians who are against self-driving cars and please explain the benefit to humanity that like you see that we don't because millions of people die every year in car crashes and this is an incredibly effective way to improve that and yeah there may be some like small bumps along the way But nobody's writing articles about the thousands of car fatal car accidents caused by human drivers. Um, it, it's, it's this, this is exactly like, it's a perfect example of why I'm like, I don't care if you start a tech company, you don't have to change your whole life, but please, if you read this book, just become one of the people who sees technology for the benefit that it is and the life-saving improvements that it can have. Don't believe the headlines written by the some media who's working for a politician who's been paid off by the taxi mafia or whatever the crazy convoluted incentive mess is that is causing these people to functionally lie to the population about the the benefits of this technology and like let's please find ways to support it and find ways to see through the bullshit and find ways to try new technologies and stand up to the people who who are shouting who are shouting down the opposite again back to lewis's point about like stand in your truth this is really important shit and if the if the you know sane silent majority doesn't rise up to some of these crazy minority loud minority voices like we'll see more repression of technology that could be saving lives extending lives creating abundance like giving us this next industrial revolution it's a it's a crazy important thing that most people don't spend any energy thinking about and if you don't question it you you tend to just fall into the default sort of view of the majority, which in this case I think is is not just wrong but harmful. There's like several words here I want to uh, kind of emphasize. So Kyle's talking about like you know academic papers, and you're talking about traditional media. I think these are like what this book hopefully teaches you is that those things aren't fungible. One that they're not like necessarily like not all media is created equally, sure. not all academic papers are created equally. So like. And this is why I think the Bitcoin whole universe, and I, I'm saying Bitcoin, not crypto, because Bitcoin's very different, is it teaches you just like, well, not to distrust authority, but to, to just question things like that. Like milk, milk is <laughs> yes. not one thing, right? right? Beef is not one thing. There's good beef, bad beef, good milk, bad milk. And if it doesn't come from an animal, it's not milk, yeah. right? Like there's like, there's a whole list of like things like that. And it's like an academic paper is not, does not represent a credible, truthful thing. It represents... I, well, I don't even know what it some of them do like, and some half, of them don't probably 95 an of expert focus. to tell the difference yeah some of them do for sure exactly and i think people weaponize like yes. these words like education like calling college education right it's like you do learn a thing that does not you do not like these are they, they make it sound like it is a box that is just acceptant yep. and it's just not the case and even like something like vaccines are an example of like a technology that has done a crazy amount of good but people hide behind that to like then like that infinite shield to then be do all sorts of other questionable things 
So I think just like taking these words at face value, thinking it means one thing, like the more of those that you poke holes in, like money, money's another one. Like poke holes, what does money mean? Yeah. Not all money is actually money. And this, this book teaches you to poke holes in all of these different things, which allows you to, again, get closer and closer in, to like in the truth, truth. I mean, I think I said in the introduction, like technology and truth are your sword and shield, like on your quest to build the future, right? Like it, yes. it is not, I'm not ranting about truth because of any reason other than if you have bad information, it's tough to create the outcome that you want in the world. And there are different, I mean, beef, not all beef is beef. Like there are different types of milk. There are different types of truth. And the first part of that section, like details, like this is scientific truth. This is technical truth. This is a political truth. This is an economic truth. This is a, like a cryptographic truth. These are all different kinds of truth and different forms of fact and it's really important to learn to see the difference between them and once you have that sort of base that base in reality you feel like you're seeing the real thing a totally different set of opportunities opens up to you like that's that's why it's important not so you can be right not so you can be like win an argument not so you can change somebody's mind but so that you can you can really create the outcome that you want and have it have the results that you want. Like that's the important piece. I mean, if we could just take that, the implementation of that as a program and put it into everyone's mind, that would be, and that's kind of like what this book's trying to do, right? It's like, that is how you improve the world and make the world a better place. Yeah. That's, that's what the technology that's like of a the, book what we're fighting against. And the op, right? like, the opposite of that is like evil. Yeah. It's like, yeah, so. <laughs> it is. It's like you talk about, you know, Kyle and I were talking about this before the podcast about just Stalin, but like you can't build like lies can't build an actual breakthrough in terms mm -hmm. of like, it's like Theranos, right? Like you can't, you can't actually you can go for a period of time, but there's, there's an end state to how far the lie can go and in terms of building technology. If you don't have mathematical truths and engineering truths and physics and stuff, it's like, you don't build yes. a thing. I that thought works. that was one of the most interesting. I remember reading that line. I, I think it, I probably had to read it twice to like fully grok it. But there's in that truth section, it talks about like why truth is important. And I think economic truth in particular. And it uses the example of like demo democratic capitalism versus communism. And it's like the reason that communism fell apart was that it required lies. Like it required lies to keep the machine going and capitalism required truth. Now, capitalism is not perfect, and there's plenty of edge cases that are that are problematic, but it is a better system than communism, and that is something that is like a deeply held belief of mine, and also seems to be something that we are taking for granted as, as a as a country in the U.S. now. Which oh my is, goodness, we have like open socialists sitting in Congress, which is like a crazy fucking thing if you think about it from a slightly more historical context. And if you think about it from a, the perspective of truth, right? Like that's a, that's a challenge. And the information around that is, is, uh, <laughs> should be regarded with suspicion. I, I think yeah, we'll do a couple of rapid fire questions and I want to spin a little bit positive Please. here. I think that there's nothing <laughs> good to have come from like ignoring these conversations gets yeah. us deeper in the hole is the thing, right? It just ignoring these conversations gets us deeper in the hole. It's not yeah. fun, but it's like at the end of the day, funds one variable and it's not the only variable to, to maximize for all the time but the book and i had i had listed like five takeaways we covered most of them right like the book in my opinion covers the importance of thinking for yourself and teaches you how to do it teaches you the value of de thinking deeply and often about incentives it teaches you to improve your media diet and why that's important why we need more tech evangelists and then finally this is what i'm getting into why mm -hmm. it's also a golden age for builders i feel like that's like the yeah. that's like the the positive yep. spin from the book and it's like, let's speak about that. We discussed nuclear a little bit, but there's like so many other frontiers that it's a golden age to be a builder in as well. What are some of those just like super exciting in yeah, addition to nuclear? There, there's, I think, a paragraph. I, it, it, this, this book is very full of business ideas, I said, and it is also full of frameworks and technologies that show you sort of where the emerging opportunities are. There are paragraphs of areas where biology just lists all of the things that are coming right like rapid fire it's ar it's vr it's robotics it's industrial robotics it's drones it's crypto which is still incredibly early like if you read a book like um 
oh, what's the the financial cycles? No, fourth um, earnings. I'll find it and we can link it. But it, it talks. It's like Ray Dalio um, or something else. On the author's name also, which is a shame. Describe media because otherwise we can't make it. <laughs> yeah. Wh um, what are, what are, what's it, it, it talks talks about, about learning the financial the cycles? Sort of uh, the intermix of technology and finance and how long it takes for a book to, or a, to a new technology to fully permeate a society. And it's like on the order of 50 years. So recognizing that like, I mean, crypto I blockchain basically techno okay technological technological revolutions and financial capital is the name of the book it is written by an economist named carlotta perez and it is like it's a small book it's a little it's a little thick because it's academic it's a slightly academic but it's a it's an easy read and it will show you the the cycle um and you could just google it and see like the chart and the chart is like the summary of it and you will have seen a similar chart before but it's like the peak of expectations, the valley of despair, the slow grinding out of the implementation, and then eventually the crossing of the chasm into the mainstream, and then the decreasing cost as it sort of reaches a global thing. And like she's charted this out for a ton of different technologies that have happened throughout history. It's an old, it's old-ish book. What's the? Yeah, it's it's That's very like relative. during the hype. It was published in twenty three uh, two two thousand three. I'm not sure if that was the first edition, but like that's the page that I'm looking at. It, it's, it was very like, it was a relevant read at the peak of the crypto thing. We're like, oh yeah, see what we're going through. Crypto is absolutely a thing, but we are like in a little bit of the trough. It's absolutely going to change everything over 30 or 40 years. But like, there's plenty of time for everybody who was a naysayer to feel right. And there's, it's going to be a painful, like slow grind out of adoption and building and retooling for all the people who were pro to get vindicated. And nuclear mm. like same thing ar vr maybe same thing we've seen a ton of like boom and bust uh, optimism optimism and disappointment cycles in vr like uh, maybe going back to like the 80s i'm not sure when the exact first version was but there's plenty of things in that history there's i mean ai is a truly enormous one all of these are provide huge bridge to builders and to the individual and provide a lot of different directions Robotics, obviously, like way more capital intensive than something AI. There's still like the fact that AI is coming and crypto is coming means there's still a ton of uh, value to be created in software. But I also really want to encourage people to look outside software and get a little more adventurous on, I mean, uh, the everything that's happening with CRISPR and like this is not my area. So like I can't go, I'm very shallow in this, but I know that what is happening in like writing of genetics is an incredible fundamental technological breakthrough that is just going to take time to become legislated and grown and tested and turned into a thing if you read if you read anything about the capabilities of nanotechnology and material science breakthroughs that we are like edging towards that's where you get into the like oh shit like the industrial revolution the industrial revolution combined like the invention of steel and internal combustion and railroads and telegraphs, like all of those technologies sort of overlapping and mutually reinforcing oil and gas. And like, we have another one of those coming with AI and nanotech and nuclear that are going to hundred X our physical capabilities. And we'll be, like with mature nanotech, we'll be able to build 10 mile high towers of diamond that can like elevate things into space for zero marginal cost. We'll be able to build flying cities and materials that self-regenerate around a nuclear reactor. Um, we'll be able to basically fabricate food. And this is all in that, the, yeah, the, the flying, flying car, car the book resource I have for that. It's, it is, I did an episode of my podcast, smart friends. That is one is just an interview with the author and one is my notes and highlights from the book. So like that was a huge red for me also, you know, while I was working on this, this biology book about like oh shit, like there is such cool stuff coming. And the difference between that happening in 40 years and 100 years is the difference between like, do you want to see us build like a whole space colony? Do you want to see us achieve incredible physical impossibilities? Do you want to see us feed and house and water every single human being? Do you want to sort of build like flying cities? Do you want to see energy becoming too cheap to meter? Literally like you pay a flat rate for an infinite amount of energy. There is all of these things are physically possible and on the edge of being either being discovered and being or being implemented or being grown um 
yeah, I, I see incredible technology getting moved into farming um, as that process gets sort of robotified. If you consider how much human effort goes into the logistics around driving and trucking and ports and things like that, that can get turned into sort of zero, zero or very low marginal cost robotics. It's a, it's a mind blowing pill to take and it will make you incredibly optimistic about all the things that are possible. And at the same time, it'll make you very impatient for all the people who are like holding up progress and, and just yeah. exactly. If only we could stop punching exactly. ourselves in the face um, and stepping on our own toes. So, yeah. and I know, I know like that some people are struggling to be optimistic and that there's reasons for that. Like there, there's very media based reasons for that. There's maybe like dopamine and phone and social media and video game related reasons for that. There's, there's, there's mental health, there's physical there's mental like, health diet, related. health and, and food supply reasons for that. But there are also incredible reasons to be optimistic. And I hope, I hope that this book has some of those and that it's the rabbit hole to a lot more for people. And that, you know, it feels good to work and it feels good to work on important things. And if you can find your way towards one of these frontiers, towards one of these technologies, or even just being an activist for them and a supporter of them like it has given me a renewed sense of purpose and a renewed sense of excitement. And that really infuses like everything that I do. It infuses the companies I invest in, the people I hang out with, the tools that I use, the media that I watch. Like I, I love sci-fi even more now than I used to before because I see it as sort of, um, opti <laughs> I should say specifically like the optimistic sci-fi. And it's given me a little more impatience for like, you know, b randomly blaming nuclear energy as like the bad guy in a James Bond movie or whatever. So anyway, th th this is my, my turn to rant. Um, but I think that's really important. And I think it can be a huge, a huge fresh relief for somebody. And if this is the, supposed to be the lightning round, then I just like fucked up so bad. We don't, we've, we've fucked up the lightning <laughs> yeah, round. Yeah, lightning time. round's never, like, never been a lightning we round. We asked like an infinite <laughs> question. We're just like, why are you optimistic about the future? Um, <laughs> but in three words, yeah. In the last episode of this podcast, we defined the sandwich as carb, protein, carb, roughly three years ago. And you probably, I mean, that was at one point a technology, I'd like to point that out. But in the last three years, I'm sure you've had lots of carb, protein, carbs. I'm wondering, do you have a new favorite? I, I just got back from South Africa and I did not have a single remotely disappointed meal in South Africa. I had some f incredible burgers down there that are still like very fresh and top of mind. And it, it, yeah, it, I mean, fresh, local, like there's something about like going to a, like a 2000 acre farm and the restaurant in the middle of it and being like everything that I'm about to eat on this plate came from these 2000 acres and it's all fucking delicious. So it's, it's given me an appreciation for the like, a renewed appreciation, I should say, for the like hyper local decentralized farming stuff. And that's another not to not to make a, a beautiful thing negative, but that's another thing to be aware of is like I, I got friends who are farmers and they're like, the government is making it pretty close to illegal to like operate a small scale like food generating business. And it's a shame when you go to a different country that has an amazing system for it and you have an incredible meal that came from the land around you, like you're like, this is the life. This is awesome. We should do some of this. I think I want to be respectful of your time. I don't have, I have a ton more questions here. I just think what I'm really excited to see is I think that biology is something Kyle's talked about. Uh, again, just in the days leading up to this conversation we're preparing for is just mm. biology is very much not an everyman. And like, at least in like intellect, it doesn't come across the way. I'm sure like, you know, he played football in high school and has all sorts of relatable things that make him human. But my point is like, no one's going to, a very small percentage of Word. people are going to listen to an eight hour apology Lex Freeman interview. A very small amount of people are going to listen to that. And an even, a smaller amount of people are going to read this book, but it's a bigger amount of people than the original, right? It's just like, this is, you made Bology so much more presentable than like just listening to raw Bology audio. And I think that's really exciting because so many people like are losing this ideas because he's just, I don't want to say difficult, he's yeah. just hard. He's just smart and just like fast. And a lot of people just can't keep up. And then I think a lot of people, like hopefully this podcast has been simpler than the book and easier, but it will motivate you to like go get the momentum to read the book. But I just think Twitter and YouTube are just, and hopefully TikTok, <laughs> maybe Nat Eliason will just crush some book talk. But like those are just gonna like make all these videos and animators and graphic videos and just the 
and to see like we're at the very beginning of the ripple this book is going to have from like you really catalyzing like okay Balaji's up here I'm going to bring him here and then everyone's yeah. just kind of slowly making him more mass appealing and it's just going to be really transformative yeah, thank hopefully. you I, I hope that this effects. achieves that you know like I, I have heard a lot of times um it, almost the exact words that you used just have trouble bringing him down to earth and and Balaji is a galaxy brain you know he he could talk for 10 minutes in a you know, logically consistent chain with like nested examples and counter examples and caveats. And it's really, it's hard for people to follow. It's hard, honestly, like the audio, even if you transcribe it and read it, it's difficult to follow each one. And I, I obviously listened to many of these interviews many times. I will say I've worked really hard to make this book very accessible and very clear, even though some of the ideas are, I don't even think they're advanced necessarily. They're just they're important and they are new, I guess, like they're out there, you know, they like, I think Kyle said earlier, they're mind blowing. Like, I think these are really important, interesting ideas, but I, I think I made them accessible in this book. And I actually, I ran every single thing through like a, a grammar, like sentence structure, readability level thing. So like, if you have been psyched out by biology before or haven't found him approachable, like this is the this is the version that you will have no problem consuming and understanding and applying and hopefully able to then explain to other people or carry those ideas forward like it's not it's it's a uh, dense with insights i think like i hope you highlight something on every page but it's not a it's not a you know master class 12th grade reading level kind of thing like i have have talked to other people who like had early access to it they're like, man, I read this thing in a day, like didn't put it down, like flew through it. And I, I love to hear that. Like, that's what I want it to feel like. I want it to feel rereadable, easy. I want it to feel like a conversation with a really smart person who's talking to you exactly where you are and presenting the best version of their ideas to you. And I think that's a really useful thing. And to your point, I think a lot of people can pick those ideas up from there and run with it that they may not have been able to do before. And I hope that this is is another domino in the chain that helps kind of break it out and let it like create a lot more proliferation of these ideas that reach a lot more people in a lot of different mediums and i really encourage that amazing we could go <laughs> i mean like we could do a lex freeman style eight hour interview i'm sure like i could have done it for sure but fortunately the book will be out by the time this is published we're going to coordinate them to be the same time same day same thing uh, where's the free version? Where's the paperback version? If someone wants to hold one, because I already read it, but I want it like a physical. I'm a, I'm gonna be buying. I don't actually know where I can buy it either. Yeah, so. uh, and where are you most active book on the website? Well. Is balajianthology.com, and you'll find links to all the different versions, free and paid. There, obviously, it'll be on Amazon, and that's probably the easiest place for most people. My personal stuff is all linked from ejorgensen.com. So you'll find my newsletter, you'll find my podcast, you'll find my venture fund, some of our investments everything kind of comes out of there, my blog. So uh, whatever you're interested in, whatever direction you want to go from here, that's got all the books linked to it and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm on Twitter like all the time. Uh, if you want to come hang out on Twitter, I'd love Perfect. it. Perfect. Amazing. Thanks so much, Eric. This is uh Thank you. I, I hope so. Event. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for, you know, being early readers and supporters and having me back on the podcast. And yeah, I, I really appreciate what you guys do. And thanks for helping me share this with people.